Let's do it this way. Let's draw a line here. And let's just say, now this represents a system. And over here is the system. Is everybody in this system? No. So what we have then is we have another line here. And we either are or we are not a part of God's kingdom. He only sees it here. Either we have eternal life already, or we're someone that still needs it. That's all he sees. There is none of this. It's here or here. That's all it is. And so what we're saying is we've got to get this system out of our minds. Because if you're willing to put somebody here, I'll guarantee you, you have put yourself on this line somewhere too. And it's just as damaging and damning to your own self-esteem, <clears throat> excuse me, of who you are and your value as it is to put somebody else somewhere. Let's say you see yourself here or here. How does that affect how you see yourself as being here or here? You've removed yourself from this equation. You're now looking at yourself this way. The biggest point that I want you to see this morning is that this system does not exist except in the minds of carnal people. Gracious God in heaven, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving each one of us. Thank you for loving all of us. Help us, Lord, to learn that you do and that we should too. Bless us as we study that we can be more equal in our attempt to reach souls in need of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Gospel of John, chapter 3. And we will pick up with verse 1. Gospel of John, chapter 3. Now, I like how this starts. Think about it, piece by piece. Pretend you didn't know the story already. I know you do. But just look at it one piece at a time. There was a man. Okay, so this is a story about a person. Okay, well then we want to know, what about this person? It's a rather generic term. There was a man. But obviously something unique happens or we wouldn't be telling the story. There was a man of the Pharisees. Oh, so this isn't just any man. This is of a certain group, some specific group. Group. Now, what were the Pharisees? Leaders in the church. Leaders in the church? Very influential. Spiritual leaders because they're in the church. They're spiritual leaders. So here's a person that is a spiritual person, studied spiritual things, and they lead other people's spiritual lives. They have spiritual Impact. Now, when we say spiritual, we're saying our relationship with God. When we're talking about our relationship with God, we're talking about our relationship with eternity. Whether or not we're going to spend eternity in death, non-existence, or in life. And all that God gives us with that life. So there was a man of the Pharisees. And his name is Nicodemus. So we know exactly who he is. We're not afraid to say. And he was a what? A ruler. a ruler. So he has control. He's not just a spiritual teacher, but he rules. Other people are subject to him. He influences people's lives, not just by influence, but by dictating. He can control. If he says, you do. 
Of who? Who did he rule? Jesus. Jews. Who were the Jews? Those were the people in the Jewish nation, the Israelites. In terms of the bigger picture of the great controversy, who are they? God's people. God's people. God chose Abraham, and these are his descendants, therefore the recipients of his promises to Abraham. You notice I avoided saying they were God's chosen people. Abraham was God's chosen person, and he chose to bless Abraham's seed. Now, you and I need to keep in mind that there's times when we need to kind of cut our ego down just a little bit, too. That sometimes we build ourselves up in ways that God has not said that he did. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us, good and bad. How could it be bad? How do we sometimes see ourselves that God doesn't? Or is that our subject today? If we make it personal, and why shouldn't we? I know we're looking at it from the standpoint of we discipling other people and how we should relate to other people. But shouldn't we look in the mirror and reflect it back at ourselves? And say, am I seeing myself as the rich or the elite or the powerful? And if I do, how does that affect my influence for good? Very important questions, aren't they? Very, very important questions. So here's a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of God's chosen people. Now to keep this in perspective, folks, we have to remember he's a religious leader of God's chosen people whom God has chosen to use to lead and influence the entire world to understand and know about God. So in the whole universe, there is a world that they are looking at. And in that world is a nation that they're looking at. In that nation are leaders that are influencing it. And amongst that group, we are now looking at one man. How important is it of how this man thinks and what he believes? Who's watching him? The universe. Is the universe watching you? A little scary sometimes, isn't it? But it's a fact. It's a fact. Is the universe watching Nicodemus more than they're watching you? Perhaps. Perhaps. Is it possible they're watching you more than Nicodemus? Perhaps. Give me the same answer. Because could be too. The point simply is, it's not the rich and the famous that are necessarily the only ones that are being watched. In fact, maybe like you, the angels don't pay so much attention to them. Maybe they have more interest in some of the other folk. And maybe that's us. So my point simply is, is from the start, what we learn today, we must not apply just to how we view other people, but even how we view ourselves. Because how we view ourselves can affect how we view everybody else. In fact, it just does. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to... Jesus. I hope all of us have too. Maybe not by night. Maybe so. I go to him a lot at night, don't you? Not to hide, just... Night is a good time to talk to him as well as any other time, right? But this man, he's coming to Jesus at night. Why do you suppose Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night? He didn't Verse want one. to be seen. Didn't want to be seen? What was that? Verse 1. Verse 1. <laughs> because of who he is. Now, wait a minute. You're implying something. <laughs> Why would he be criticized, Linda? 
Well, because uh, Jesus was teaching radical things and um, they didn't consider him a, a religious person. The Pharisees. Oh, didn't. so the leadership, the elite, if I may use a kind term, the elite did not look up to Jesus, but down their noses at Jesus. Why? They didn't like him. Why? He stepped on their tails and went home he did. empty. Because what? They often went home empty after listening to him. Okay. What were you, somebody else they was saying? They didn't do things the way they did. Okay. He stepped on their toes. He stepped on their toes? You see, when we think about it, if we expect X and somebody else says, well, you know, really it's down here, <coughs> then these people get offended. Well, huh, I'm up here. I'm better than that. You telling me? So now when these people or this circumstance takes precedent over them, they're offended because you're trying to drag me down. Jealous. Do you have a comment? You see, the problem is when we go back to what we were looking at before. There's this continuum from people who are on the top or think they are and the people on the bottom, or who think they are, and there's, there seems to be a bottom here, but there's no top, how high you can go. There's always somebody that thinks they're better yet than the other guy. Right? It just seems that way. And so, if we're going to put ourselves on a scale this way, meaning more value, because of my intellect, or my position, or my money, or my influence, or my culture, my face is prettier, or whatever it might be. More people watch my movie than your movie. So therefore I'm more famous than you. So therefore I'm up here. Yet I can overdose on drugs just like the guy right down here. So what criteria do we use to climb this ladder? The fact is, is people use many different criteria to climb the ladder. And we named some of them, didn't we? How do we see people here? The Pharisees saw themselves up here. And they kept seeing Jesus while he appeared to be up here because so many people listened to him and so on, yet they saw him doing things that kept pushing himself down. So here's a Nicodemus up here. Notice I said a Nicodemus, because there were many of them. Here were these people up here looking at this saying, how is it? He acts like he's elite. He's a leader. People follow him. He's intelligent. What he says you can't confute. You know, it's just, and yet he associates down here. And so they're confused. Because they're so sure that this is real and important. In fact, these are the people that go to heaven. These are the people that don't. By their judgment. By their standard. By their beliefs. By their teachings. By their rulings. And so for Jesus to associate down in here was to pull himself out of here. So while he's intelligent, while he's influential, while he's powerful, while people are just following, following him in droves, their attention is getting less and less. People are respecting their position less. So they want to associate with him, but then he keeps pushing himself down here. And of course, that would take them down there, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. If they associated with him. So while I'm intrigued by this man, Jesus, why don't I do this? I've got some questions for him, but I'll go at night. I won't let anybody up here know that I went because they might look down on me and demote me. I won't let the people down here know it because they might think that 
you know, I'm not worthy of being up here anymore. I'm risking everything that I've ever had or hope to have. So he comes at night. Came to Jesus by night and said to him, now I want you to watch this. Rabbi, which means what? Teacher. teacher. So what is he admitting? He, he's a teacher. He knows something. The last part is what I wanted. He knows things that others don't know. You have to do that to be a teacher. Have you ever seen a teacher where the students knew more than the teacher? How long did that last well? It just doesn't, does it? If it's voluntary, the students walk away because they say he has nothing to tell me. And so the teacher, I was told, needs to know 10 times as much as you plan to teach. And I think Jesus knew 100 times more than even the ones up here, and they thought they knew it all. So he comes to Jesus, and he calls him a teacher. He recognized Jesus had knowledge. Rabbi, we know... What was that first word? We. Who's we? The Pharisees, yes. Is he representing his whole group? Well, in a it sounds like way. it. It sounds like it, doesn't it? We know. It, it, you know, we're not going to refute that. I don't have an argument, Jesus, with that. You're the teacher. We know. Let me ask you a question. Do you really think they did know? That Jesus knew a lot they didn't know? Do you think they really did? Well, I think they began to recognize that when he was only 12 years old. <laughs> a little hard to miss, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. But real often we say we know when we don't have the conviction to stand alone and say, I know. There's a difference between knowing and having the conviction to stand with what you know is what you're saying. And that's true, absolutely true. What good is knowing without a conviction to live it and stay with it, believe it and follow it? Well, there's a greater sense of power when you say we rather than I. That's true too. So it isn't just him. I represent a class, a group. And if that is the case here, if that is the reason for using that word, he could have said, I know. If he chose to use that word for that reason, the lesson just expands a little more. Because let's keep looking. We know, now we have to ask the question what? That you, now it's about Jesus, that you are a teacher from God. Hold the fort. What were we just talking about? That the whole universe is looking at planet Earth. On planet Earth, God's people, of God's people, they're looking at the leadership first to see how are they leading. How are they responding to all the blessings God has given, given them? And what are they doing with it and how is it affecting? Now we find out the leadership knows that this teacher came from God. God sent. Now that's interesting because there were many people, as we read the Gospels, during that three and a half year that Jesus taught, there were many people that struggled to understand that principle, that Jesus did come from God. Now to what extent he understood that, you know, not much is said here. Is Jesus God or is he just sent from God? But in any case, He's recognizing that the authority, the truth that Jesus is presenting had to come from God. What a testimony. They understood. Yes? What made him think that? What do you think made him think that? What would you guess? Miracles. Miracles? Mm -hmm. Truths that he presented that baffled them? And yet when they heard them, they knew they had to be true. Here was Jesus at the age of 12 asking questions that they should have answers for. And then he gives them the answer and they say, duh me, I should have known that. Because now they recognize it from the scriptures they knew. 
So I think that's how they knew. And as these people had taught about God, even though they had many wrong conclusions, even the people down here recognized the truth. And they said, he knows things about God that these people don't know. He's telling the truth about God. These guys, their stories are complicit. They get confused. Have you ever thought that about theology you've heard in different places? Yeah? You know, there's something about truth that's really just fantastic, and that is it doesn't matter who is listening to it, rich, poor, uh, a Ph.D., or someone who's uneducated, people are not stupid, and they can recognize truth when they hear it. And that's what was so compelling, I think, about Jesus and the way he taught people. They could recognize it. Let me say it another way to reinforce what you're saying. I've many times told people one reason I like being an Adventist is that I don't have to apologize for my theology. Everything I believe connects properly to the other things I believe. You listen to other denominations, you listen to other people teach scripture, and you find many things in, that, in those teachings that one part doesn't line up with the next part. I mean, how many gymnastics has the Christian world gone through to figure out how to get a story that Jesus is coming back to get us, and yet we're already in heaven? So they have to make up things and find a text and twist it and, and make it say something that it doesn't say. We don't have to do that. Isn't that beautiful? We can just read the Bible and there it is. And that truth connects to the next truth, which connects to the next. It's consistent. And people recognize that. So I don't have to apologize for anything I believe. I can back it all up with Scripture. Scripture is the foundation of everything I believe. These people saw that. So, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no one, and here's why he's convinced, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Is that a good argument? Mm -hmm. But he fails to acknowledge Christ as God or the Son of God. Doesn't mention that here, does he? But at least that God is with him. He got that far. Now, what is the principle he's stating here? Someone state it back to me. I know we read it. Put it in your words. What is he really saying is his evidence for believing that God is with him? Miracles. The miracles, the things that he does. Now, maybe it includes his teaching. Hopefully it does. Hopefully he had that in mind. So the things you teach, God would have to be with you. And all these things you're doing, feeding the 5,000, uh, calming the storm, raising the dead, you know, healing the sick, and all these things that he does, God just has to be with you. We can't find any other explanation. So we've concluded, we these people, that you've come from God and God is with you. Now, I have a question for you. What is Nicodemus' question that he comes to Jesus for? Or, I can let you not answer that question if you want to say that Nicodemus came strictly to tell Jesus that. And that's all. He just wanted him to know that. Do you believe that's the case? Okay, so then you think he had a question. All right, what's his question? He didn't get a chance to ask it. Maybe you don't know his question? He might have wanted the same, how do I get what you got type, you know, uh, can I be like you maybe, and what do I have to do to be like you? You could have, but you don't know his question? He was fixing to get the answer. Why do you not know his question? He never asked it. Why did he not ask it? Jesus had something to say. I think there's something that we can assume, and we have to be careful assuming, of course. I think there's something we can assume. That Jesus was always, always, always looking to touch a heart and lead them 
put their hand into the hand of God. So Jesus doesn't wait for people to make a fool of themselves or anything else. He's quick when given the opportunity to go right to the heart of the issue. So, you know, had he waited for the question, maybe it would have been harder to bring it back to the fact of what Nicodemus himself needed. Irrespective of what his question is, Jesus heads right straight Whoops, I'm going backwards to get this right. I used to be able to do it. Jesus aims straight to the heart. And look at many of Jesus' conversations, interactions with people. He doesn't talk about the weather. Never seen a conversation about politics. Even if it involved leadership and the Romans and the taxes and all of that, he just immediately brought it right back to God and God's requirements. Jesus had a one-track mind. I mean, he had a pretty narrow existence when you think about it. It was so small that all he saw life about was his Father and eternity. Now, is that small or what? It's pretty big, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Because when we look at the world, it's soon going to be gone, isn't it? It's just material things that come and go. We buried one of my uncles just a few days ago. There's nothing that he owns now. He has no control over anything now. Anything he ever owned or earned is nothing now. And anything you inherit, soon somebody else is going to have it. But when it comes to our soul and eternal life, Suddenly it takes on eternal perspectives, doesn't it? Forever, ever, ever. Hmm. So this narrow mind, this narrow approach to people, and everything narrows down to one thing, is really everything. He was expanding their universe from that perspective. Because everything I go to do in my life, and it's getting more and more so as the days go by, Everything that I look at, thinking maybe I should do this, I keep looking at it and it's like, and in a few days, a few months, a few years, nobody will even remember it happened. So unless it affects me and my eternal life or somebody else's, it's a pure waste of time. It has absolutely no meaning. No value. So here's Nicodemus. He's come and he's made these observations, confessions, if you please. We know you're a teacher sent from God. And Jesus jumps in to the conversation. He answered and said to him, most assuredly. How can you get any more emphatic? Not just assuredly, most assuredly. I say to you, I mean, I've got a message for you. Nicodemus came to talk to him, came to hear his words. So he says, I'm telling you, here it is. What does he say? Unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what a simple statement. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, everything's about the kingdom of God, isn't it? Everything. Well, then, if the kingdom of God is what's important, if that's what everything is, then we need to be focused on that kingdom of God. But he says the only way you can get it is to be born again. Hmm. Well, then you see Nicodemus giving a little pushback, okay? Notice here in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? A question. Was this an illustration, this born again, that was totally foreign to Nicodemus? 
Hmm. Now, uh, scholars tell us that this was a common illustration of the day. He knew it. He was very well aware of it. When I read it to you this morning, was it the first time you heard it? Of course not. And it wasn't new to Nicodemus either. So Nicodemus is kind of doing what I do sometimes when I'm confounded either by an answer that I didn't get or one that I was surprised by and I'm trying to digest that. Um, I'll start asking silly questions, you know, just trying to dig myself out of that to figure out, well, where is this going? What does it mean? What's the significance of that? I need to understand some more here. And so Nicodemus, he says, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I think while he's saying this out loud, I think his mind is trying to say, but what did Jesus mean by that? I know I've used that illustration myself, but Jesus is saying that different than the way I do. Jesus has put a different significance on it than I do. So what is he really saying? Well, that just gave Jesus a chance to explain, didn't it? Verse 5. Most assuredly, there's those two words again, put together, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter what? The kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of things in that little sentence. In the first part, Jesus said he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now he says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's the difference there? Okay, the question was, what's the difference? First one, he says you cannot see the kingdom of God. The second time, he says you can't enter it. Do you think that you can see the significance, what it means, what God's kingdom is really all about, and what it's like if you have not surrendered yourself to Christ? Or let me put it another way. Can we really understand the deep spiritual truths of God if we are not surrendered to Him? No, we cannot. We learn by faith that which we cannot see, smell, touch, and hear and taste. So we have to have the sixth sense to experience by faith that which cannot be observed with the senses. So therefore, until we surrender, God cannot continue to expose more and more of what his kingdom is. And then Jesus goes the second step, and neither will you be there. That's really what he was doing, isn't it? And neither can you attain it or receive it. So here's Jesus saying, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Why does he put both of those? Why can we not just be born of the Spirit? First. Have to have physical birth first. Okay. What does the baptism by water symbolize? Washing away, Washing away our sins. Physical. We've confessed. We've surrendered. So we've died to self and been resurrected. It's that new birth, isn't it? We've been born again in Christ. We've, we've died to our life, our choices, our will. We've turned our life now over to God. We've died to ourselves. Our sinful life comes to an end. We say, now, God, I'm living for you. And God gives us a new heart. And at baptism, he wants to do what? Baptize us with the Spirit. The Spirit. What if you are baptized with water but never receive the Holy Spirit? You're just wet. You're just wet. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. It's true because the life cannot grow and be different, right? Because the power isn't there. We cannot comprehend the thing God, things God wants us to comprehend. Neither do we have the power to live them. So first we confess, we give our life, we give ourself, we give up all of our sinful selves, our old way of living, and we dedicate it now to God. We're starting over. This is going to be a new life. Then the Holy Spirit has to move in 
to grow us. Now, this is the crucial part. We have water and spirit. If some people are accurate in their theology that's being proposed today, that all you have to do is love God. Just love Him. You can't be perfect in this life. You can't obey all the commandments and all the laws and rules of God. So why are you sweating over that? You're not going to do it anyway. So obviously God didn't intend to. If you can't do it, then he didn't ask you to. Because God wouldn't ask you to do something you cannot do. We agree with that part, don't we? We agree. So they would say, all right, you've surrendered. So just love people. And don't worry about it. And when Christ comes at the second coming, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, all your bad things will go away and you'll suddenly desire new things and just somehow you'll be a different person. Live like hell and go to heaven. That didn't sound right. Does it work that way? Not at all. So what is this for? What's missing up here? What's this for? John? Uh, Jesus said back, back, and Matthew 7, uh, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Nicodemus was asking about. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, and he refers over to 1250, where he says, for whoever does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, he is my brother, my sister, so, my mother. What did we say was the point of the water baptism? To end yeah. the old life and to re be reborn to a yeah. new life. Well, if this is a new life, how is it different if something doesn't change? So, the Spirit is to give us power to what? And that living is a different life than up here, isn't it? But it takes a profound personality change. I mean, I've seen people that have done that and gotten off the life they were living and they quit everything they were doing that was wrong, sinful. And my mother, for one, she, uh, in the late age, she's like 42, and she's 86 in March 10th. Praise God. But she's had cancer and survived that and all. She's got a strong faith, but... She's got, I don't know how many years that is, but she, yeah, and, and she's walking with the Lord. Uh, Here's where the power came from, isn't it? We can't do that in a sinful nature. So without the surrender, can we receive the power of the Spirit? No. If you have only the baptism of water, is it adequate without the power of the Spirit? No. So Jesus says this and this. You can't have one without the other and do this. How many times do you have to get baptized though? If you went backslid and went out and sinned, do you have to get rebaptized like a dozen times or just one time or ten times? Or? Jesus likened his kingdom, his receiving his kingdom to a marriage. There might be some similarities that in our marriages. Let me ask you a question. If you were married and went off and left your wife and divorced her and then repented and said, you know, really, I should be with her, can you just move back in? No. No way. Who's not going to accept that? The woman. <laughs> Nor the rest of us. <laughs> right? What is marriage about? What do you do in the marriage? Besides the ceremony, what's the it's key the part of it? Your soulmate, you marry someone you're supposed to be, love them as you love yourself, like the Ephesians where it says, you know, husband love the wife and treat her and, and with respect. And okay, so the marriage ceremony is simply a ceremony around an event where you say, okay, from this moment on, okay. now we belong together. Yeah. So if you broke it, 
You can't just come back and assume. It doesn't work that way because you aren't committed. So as many times as you completely turn your back on God and go your own direction and leave him behind. Now, I'm not talking about just straying off. We all do. But when we turn our back on God and we divorce him, when we come back, we need to be baptized again. If we don't, we're presuming. We need to make commitments. Those commitments are important. Because Satan will use the lack of a commitment to make it easier to stray again. Okay? Here's our power. Have to take this step to get access to the power. The power isn't here. This gives us the new heart so that we can receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive the power of the Holy Spirit when we're uncommitted to God. So this is our commitment. This is God's power that fills us. So Jesus goes to Nicodemus, or says to Nicodemus, if you want to live that new life, if you want to be in my kingdom, because here's where the kingdom is, folks. The kingdom isn't in the water. The kingdom is in the life. What good is a kingdom without life? So therefore, he was telling Nicodemus, as soon as you have been baptized with water, you've surrendered, you've given yourself to me, and the Holy Spirit comes in and gives you this power, you are experiencing the kingdom. But if you haven't, if you haven't been raised up with any religion whatsoever, no nothing, when you accept Jesus, that's, you're on your road to repentance. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you really accepted him and you're on that road to repentance, it might take you four years. It might take you 10 years. Yeah. It might take you 40 years yeah. <laughs> before you get that baptism. Yeah. Mm. No, it's you true. Got the power to do something. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. You're absolutely right. And, and what you've just expressed is the reason why we, looking at somebody, putting them on the scale somewhere, is so destructive. If we see them down here, we kind of turn up our nose at them. We see them up here and we envy them. And it just cripples us. We need to see each heart over here. There's, this is a worldly system. Here's life. Or not. So we have to get out of this mode that every human being, you look into their eyes and you say, there is a soul of God's. <gasps> Has nothing to do with how big a check you can write. Has nothing to do with your position. Has nothing to do with how much education or letters behind your name, as we say. It's not about that. Jesus was not influenced by the fact that, oh, a Pharisee came to see me. Did you notice something missing in here? I'll read it and put it back in. How's that? And you tell me if you think it was really there. Back in verse 3. Nicodemus in verse 2 had said, We know that you are a teacher sent from God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Thank you for recognizing who I am. I appreciate that. But I have something you ought to know. Let me ask you a question. Have you seen any words similar to that in any confrontation with Jesus? With anyone? Revelation. Well, in the Gospels. In one situation, Jesus did respond. He's in our lesson today. The rich young ruler. Mm -hmm. And how did Jesus respond? He said, good teacher, good master. Jesus said, there's only one that's good. So really what he was saying to the rich young ruler, you're seeing the one and only. And that means it ain't you. So as good as he thought he was, because he thought he was up here too, didn't he? The rich young ruler. He thought, that, he thought that he was very wealthy and he'd done all these commandments and he'd done all of these things. He's even helped feed the poor. He's done all of these things. And yet Jesus says, well, if you really want to be at the top, as you think you are, if that's really where you want to be, sell everything and do this. 
Oh, well, that's a little expensive, Jesus. And he walked away with a sorrowful heart because he loved all of this. And Jesus knew that from the start. Jesus was playing with him to help him see the reality. Keep all the commandments. Don't you think Jesus knew that he did? Sure he did. But he just pointed out, I know you do. He wanted to hear him say, oh, I do that. But what lack I yet? Excuse me? You're telling me you keep all the commandments and yet you're coming to me asking me what else it is you lack. Why would you ask the question? Conviction. Conviction. He knew he was lacking something, didn't he? His heart was empty. But when he heard the answer, he said, eh, that's too big a price to pay. Too big a price to pay. But we're the only ones, we humans, that see this continuum from top to bottom and everything in between. When God looks, he sees none of that. He just sees someone he loves. No matter who you are or where you are or what you have or anything else, he just loves you and wants you to live with him for eternity. Mm -hmm. Let's do it this way. Let's draw a line here. And let's just say, now this represents a system, and over here's the system. Is everybody in this system? No. So what we have then is we have another line here, and we either are or we are not a part of God's kingdom. He only sees it here. Either we have eternal life already, or we're someone that still needs it. That's all he sees. There is none of this. It's here or here. That's all it is. And so what we're saying is we've got to get this system out of our minds. Because if you're willing to put somebody here, I'll guarantee you, you have put yourself on this line somewhere too. And it's just as damaging and damning to your own self-esteem, <clears throat> excuse me, of who you are and your value as it is to put somebody else somewhere. Let's say you see yourself here or here. How does that affect how you see yourself as being here or here? You've removed yourself from this equation. You're now looking at yourself this way. The biggest point that I want you to see this morning is that this system does not exist except in the minds of carnal people. Would that be like or people, somebody that's, uh, oh, this person, look what, they got all the toys and the money and, the, you know, they're, they got a PhD and they got this and they got, oh, yeah, you know, and they, they sort of uh, worship or they hang out, they want to, that's their, they, that's who they, they look up to, like you said, but they don't have any spirituality. They don't know Jesus, and they have they don't they don't have God in their life or anything. But they have right. a lot of money and all the toys and all the stuff. So people follow them around and really praise them. Actually, they're they're you know like respect their, the people for what they are and what they have. Yeah. If okay, we live in the United States. If you opened up your wallet and looked at those little green things in there, what are those? Federal notes. Federal notes. They're U.S. Dollars, okay? Now, let's say you had X number of dollars value, whatever that is. If we were in Spain, would the average person on the street have any clue of your wealth if you told them how many U.S. dollars you had? No. Probably not. So you'd have to interpret that, wouldn't you? You'd have to interpret that into another values system, okay? So here we are. We look at people in... This value system, we put them somewhere, you know, in this value system. God is saying, I don't use that system. I'm using another system over here. So the question is, if somebody is here, where would they be on that value system? Down low. Yeah, they, would, they don't want to, like you said, like the rich man, they don't want to give up what they've got to, or... 
lower their self. Some, some people don't want to hear about God and they don't want to. Then they would have to give up a lot of their lifestyle and start serving God and then you have to change. Is it possible for a person to be wealthy and rich and famous and influential and be seen by the world here? Is that possible? Okay, so it is possible that a person here could be here. Is it possible that a very spiritual person, a, a person living God's lifestyle, could be all the way down here? Okay, so they could be down here. So what's the point of this system if it isn't telling us anything about God's system? We could ask the same question here. Can a lost person be anywhere from here to here? Sure. So what does this system tell us about which one of these they're in? No. Absolutely nothing. And that's our point. But as I grow more Christ-like, I won't be seeing that either. That's I'll exactly just be correct. A soul, no matter where they are, a soul right. that needs to know about God. That's correct. Now, we know that a person has this position as seen by the world. But we must not see them that way. There's the difference. Or if they're down here, we must not see them that way. We see them as a person here that is lost, and we want to help them to get over here. Or we see them that they are here, and we fellowship with them and work with them to help find somebody else. Now, look at Nicodemus here. In verse 8, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, is he talking about blood and bones and... Uh, six, verse 6. It's verse 6. Verse 6, I'm sorry. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What he's saying is he's talking about the bigger picture, spiritually. The ideas, the values, the concepts that come from the human mind are of human value. That's all they are. Then he goes on. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So if we have ideas and concepts and principles that come from this system, the spirit, the, the non-religious, or over here, it's not over here. But what comes from here leads to life. And then he goes on. Verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see the effect. You know there's power. And because there's power, you know the spirit was there, but all you see is the change in the life. You see the behavior change. You see the attitudes change. So therefore, you know there's power to do that, because you can't do it by yourself, so you know they can't either. And so you know that the spirit of God had to be the one to do it, or it couldn't have happened. So the, we go back to the question that our lesson's about this week. And we just use one illustration from our lesson, but... The illustration is that Nicodemus needed to understand that no matter where you are in the human view has nothing to do with how God sees you. God doesn't see us on the scale at all. He only sees us as his children, lost or saved, but his children. Now, some of the things to take a minute here to point out if we see people above ourselves, what is likely, if we're looking at people that way, what likely is to be the effect in our attitudes toward them? Jealousy. Covetousness. It also, it cools our jits. You know, you get around somebody that's very rich or famous or powerful, and we're likely to not say what we ought to say because, well, you know... He's up there and I'm down here. Did Jesus have an issue with doing that? No. He could put it the way it is. He could always lead it back to this. 
no matter who they were or where they were. Again, that's why we must not look at this for the value of the soul. The value of the soul is to be a part of this kingdom. All right? Um, what, what are some of the other things that we can, how it can affect us? <clears throat> Respect what they say or what they do when they may be leading us astray. Hmm. Because if we think they're smarter, then we're more likely to pay attention to them and forget things that we know that are really true. Okay? You see why Satan likes this system? We found two big, powerful reasons not to be involved in it. Okay? What else? What else do you see? Sometimes I think I ought to sit back and if they're rich, let them support the church. And uh, if they're influential, let them carry the load. Gee, we want a doctor in every church so that uh, yeah. have, let them do it. And I fail to have the blessing. One of the churches my wife and I pastored was a small church, membership size, about like this one. There were three people in that church that made twice or more of what we had. And I considered myself to be wealthy compared to most of the church. I was the only one working. She was not working. So it was just my income as a pastor which you'll hear pastors complain about how much they make. Turn a deaf ear real quick, because we are not paupers. We'll never get rich being a pastor. Don't get me wrong. But we are not sacrificing, folks. But here were three people in that little church that made at least twice of what I did, Some, one of them considerably more. And a few years later, <clears throat> one of them, his job took him back to Australia, where he came from. So we were losing him. One of them was so dissatisfied with my continual resistance against his thinking that the poor should pay so much more of the share of the load of carrying the church than himself. Because, you know, with all of his money, he had so many demands. Besides, he had two teenage girls. You know, and how could he give to the church with all these demands upon his life. Now remember, he makes twice as much as I do. So finally, he had decided that he was going to transfer to another church where he could be more comfortable not supporting the church very much at all. So that left us with one, and I don't remember what happened, but there was some reason the third one, he was retiring or something. So we were losing three major income sources, income into the family, to the church. But I knew that in my normal giving, I was supporting the church more than any of those three. So now when the church finds out that all three of these leaders are leaving, they're coming to me, Pastor, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive financially? We're running a school. We've got this. We've got that. How are we going to survive? Now, you know one thing I could not do. I could not share with them how much they were not doing. Because all these people were leaders in the church. They were right up here. All three of them. So all I said was to him is God will provide. If we each do our part, God will provide. If you had looked at the history of the giving in our church, the local giving had been going this way. When the three left, it went just like this. Never fluctuated. The little bit that we lost from them, others said we know we're going to have to give more, and a few gave a little bit more, and it never moved. Had the church members known that they had three people, three Nicodemuses, what would it have done to them spiritually? It had been devastating, wouldn't it? So nobody ever tattled. Nobody ever told. But if anybody was paying attention, they would have known. It does affect us that way. It does. In this conference, a man said to a pastor, I know the pastor well. When the pastor started coming down on him about something, he just said, Pastor, who do you think put all the uh, hymnals in the pews? Who do you think put, who do you think put, 
So you know what the pastor did? Backed off. <laughs> Is that wise? Uh -huh. I will not back off. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Uh -huh. And I don't care how much money you have, it isn't worth a thing to bring spirituality to a church. A church will survive spiritually better poor or meeting in my house than us in a church pretending. It's not going to get us into the kingdom, folks. It isn't going to get us into the kingdom. If Jesus had not talked to Nicodemus the way he did, we would not have what Ellen White says that Nicodemus, when the church was young and the Jewish people decided to destroy the church, he gave his wealth and died a poor man. You read it in your lesson. He died a poor man, giving everything to support God's church. That is this. He crossed from here to here, irrespective of where he fell here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving all of us including the ones that are in high positions and low as they see it. Help us to not see it that way, but to see them as your children and needing in need of eternal life. Help us, Lord, to keep our vision clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.